Now to the latest on the search for Gabby Petito's fiance, Brian Laundrie. Police in Florida continue to scour an alligator infested reserve where they believe he may be, but hundreds of miles away, TMZ obtained a photo from somebody who thinks that they actually spotted Laundrie on their trail camera. Let's get right over to Marina Morocco for the very latest development. Marina. Yeah, Angie, there have been a lot of web sleuths in this entire case, potentially even leading to the remains of Gabby Petito. But investigators continuing their search tonight for Brian Laundry inside a 25,000 acre reserve near the couple's home in Northport, Florida. He's wanted for questioning and Gabby Petito's disappearance. He has not been seen since September 14th. Now the reserve, it's got hiking trails, biking trails, campsites, there's also thick foliage that covers a lot of it, making that search a challenge. Laundry's family says he told them he was headed there for a hike, left home with a backpack. And TMZ has since obtained this photo from a man who says a person that fits Laundry's description was seen on their trail camera early Monday morning. This is in Baker, Florida. That photo shows a person with a backpack trekking through the woods. Keep in mind that Baker, Florida is about 500 miles away from Northport where he was last seen. Brian Laundrie was the second-born child to parents Christopher and Roberta. Chris and Roberta had met in their wild days, and Roberta is seven years younger than Chris. Despite the gap in age, the pair seemed to complement each other's values and goals. There's not much known about his older sister Cassie, except that she's a bit rough around the edges, the type of girl who didn't care too much about teenage rat racing. While quite strong in her own right, it's safe to say she preferred the simpler things in life and dismissed the usually tiring and often vicious teenage struggle for popularity. She was blessed with the ability to simply exist, and in the ways she wanted. The type of home Brian was brought up in is very much in the shadows, with, again, not much known about the early days. Father Christopher moved around quite a bit, while Mother Roberta seemed to be the stable one. It's unclear what they both did for work. Chris, specifically, moved around Long Island quite a bit, living in Woodhaven, Bayport, Bohemia, Maspeth, Forest Hills, and Sayville. However, in 2011, Roberta secured an office position with the Suffolk County government, where she stayed until 2020. One thing is for certain about the elder laundries, they cared deeply about their children, coveted them, and in their world, their children were the world overprotective, perhaps, at times, and the broad-reaching implications of such a relationship cannot be understated. Brian was perhaps the anomaly in the laundry home, and cut from a different cloth. Part wallflower, part popular potential, he was the type of kid in school I think you would normally expect to see. Fun and innocent to the usual extents, active, although perhaps a little overweight, he was into all the things all the kids were the top trends, the hip styles, art, music, video games. There was nothing overly outstanding about him. He had friends, a modest group, perhaps a bit on the outside of the inner circle, but never dismissed. As Brian grew into and began to find his own self, he also grew out of his somewhat sloppy and chubby appearance. Losing all the weight, this was in part due to his choice to change his diet and perceptions. He wanted to see the world, live like a minimalist, or as close to it as his generation can. He embraced his ability for art and had dreams of working remotely as a graphic designer. And eventually, this dream would become reality. Bizarre Designs was formed. His designs were somewhat unique, although had a bit of a sadistic tone to them. Edgy, maybe, and most certainly a glimpse inside Brian's creative tendencies and perhaps his mentality. Romantically, he was not so much the heartthrob that kids hoped to be, at least while he was finding his way. His senior years at Bayport Blue Point High School were a different thing. All the baby fat shed, now rugged in his own right, 
artistic and with a growing confidence. He became Brian, and that kind of attitude can be magnetic. Brian would meet Gabby in high school, and the two were cordial when seen around the hallways, but there was never an attraction that grabbed hold until after graduation. Then, the two aspiring graphic designers and hopeful travel bloggers found their goals were aligned, and they rushed into each other's arms. Not everyone was excited about their courtship. Brian could be overbearing, temperamental, despite his calm public demeanor. His years as a teen spent as a part-time wallflower might have played a role in this. It isn't always an easy transition into pseudo-popularity, especially so late in someone's years. The tendency to grab at everything they can while they can is a natural thing to do when you've lived without. Possessiveness, jealousy, the insecurity-fueled walls that one may put up are done so blindly, with no reference to the outcomes. Everyone remembers their first love, and all the internal and often unwarranted angst that came of it. The battles within were often indications of what was to come, self-imposed desperation masked with an outside confidence. It's hard to say what Brian's friends thought of his transition and subsequent whirlwind relationship with Gabby. During my research, I could find very few who spoke about Brian, outside a few Reddit posts and skewed journalistic perspectives. It is safe to say, however, that not all of Gabby's friends thought too highly of them as a couple. Some might have only suspected the worst, while others bore witness to it. And as Brian and Gabby grew as a couple, their arguments also grew into public eye. Brian and his possessive jealousy, and Gabby with her sometimes chaotic OCD, the two seemed to feed an array of traits in each other, and not all of them were good. But they persevered regardless, like any star-crossed lovers. They focused on the good, and might have tried to forget the bad ever happened. In 2017, Brian's parents, Chris and Roberta, decided to leave Suffolk County and move to Northport, Florida, a quaint little city of only 75,000 people, but right smack in the middle of the beautiful Florida sun. There, they bought a 10,000 square foot property and set up a business called Juicer Services, a company that sold and serviced juicing machines and equipment. Chris was the president and Roberta the VP. Currently, the business is listed as closed. While in Florida, Christopher would also stretch his political wings and proudly state his affiliation with the Florida Democratic Party. The differences between the two dominant political parties in America, the Democrats and Republicans, could not be farther apart. The Democrats are fiercely liberal, wanting a sort of twisted fairness across all people, focusing on community and social responsibilities, higher taxes for higher earners, universal health care, and decreased military funding. While the Republicans are almost exactly opposite, a conservative, right-leaning party, believing in justice and individual rights, a blanket tax forum, increased military funding, and privatized health care, in short. Florida itself has traditionally been a democratic state, and as political tensions have risen over the last few terms, the line between individual beliefs and political rights have become almost fanatical. People have been holding on to their side with a distinct fierceness that was never present before. They've begun acting within their political mindset on their own as individuals, twisting the law to their favor for a pat on the back or searching for the validation that they are right and no one else is. It wouldn't be long before Brian and Gabby decide to join Chris and Roberta in the sun-soaked Florida. A choice for change as much as a choice for security, Brian and Gabby moved into the basement suite of his parents' house. They were able to save money and live mostly free from the pressures of the real world. This was their time to settle in and decide what's next. A home of their own, a family, maybe just a tidy nest egg to have at their disposal. Brian would ask Gabby for her hand in marriage in July of 2020, and she said yes, emphatically. And for a brief moment, the two forgot everything else and fell lovingly backwards into the world they had hoped to create. Freedom with each other, their future was an open book with empty pages, and the pair was eager to fill them with tales of their adventures, starting with their second cross-country trip, delaying the wedding and bending COVID restrictions to their benefit. 
The pair launched on their journey in late June of 2021. They had converted a Ford Transit van into an essential tiny home, something Gabby called their garden on wheels. Kansas, Colorado, Utah. The two picked a veritable hit list of places to see and capitalized on their ability to set up home wherever they were, spending days at each of the nation's national treasures. However, being in tight quarters for such a long time with even the most compatible of pairs would be a trial for anyone. The tensions between any two people stuck in such a small space is sure to heighten old tensions and bring about new, and Brian and Gabby seem to always be on the cusp of some disagreement, and on August 12th, these maybe kept behind closed doors tensions rose to the surface. A number of witnesses saw the couple engaged in an argument on the side of the road outside Moab, Utah. The argument was allegedly over a phone and ended with Brian assaulting Gabby. More than one 911 call was made and police were dispatched to investigate. They caught up with Brian and Gabby on the highway and pulled them over. Body cam footage shows the pair in the midst of their turmoil, Gabby crying and bidding her role in the arguments, with Brian acting somewhat detached. Police suggest they separate for the night, and Brian agrees, telling them he'll get rid of her. Brian spends the night in a hotel and Gabby in their van. They reconvene the next day and continue on as if nothing had happened. August 17th, Brian suddenly takes a flight to Tampa from Salt Lake City. He allegedly made the trip to obtain some items and empty and close a storage unit so they could extend their road trip. However, it's more likely that they needed a break from each other, and this was as good an excuse as any to take it. Gabby stayed at the Fairfield Inn and Suites on her own, soaking up the sun poolside until Brian's return on August 23rd. They would stay one night at the inn together before leaving for Utah. It's safe to assume that the problems the two were having were perhaps forgiven, but not entirely forgotten. With very little time to decompress, shake it off, and move forward with clear minds, they must have had those relationship demons lurking just beneath the surface, traveling in the van with them, but they continued on regardless. Last episode, in part one, I incorrectly said that the last Instagram post from Gabby was on August 12th. However, as I've come to discover, the last post was in fact on August 26th, with her posing in front of a butterfly mural in Ogden, Utah. August 29th, a video was uploaded by a TikTok account stating she and her boyfriend had given Brian a ride home from an area near Coulter Bay Village. If it was laundry, he was hitchhiking alone. She alleges that Brian freaked out when he discovered that they were headed to Jackson Hole instead of Jackson, and left the vehicle at 609 near the Jackson Lake Dam, only 30 minutes after being picked up. She noted that Laundry offered them $200 for the 10-mile ride, and did not appear dirty, despite claiming to be camping for days. Hi, my name is Miranda Baker, and on August 29th, my boyfriend and I picked up Brian at Grand Teton National Park at 5.30 at night at Coulter Bay. Um, I'm hoping this can help someone identify him because I saw him from TikTok, which then made me call the authorities and um, my boyfriend and I have been in contact with a bunch of different people to help um, piece together different parts of this case. But we picked him up at Coulter Bay, like I said, at 5.30. He approached us asking us for a ride because he needed to go to Jackson, which we were going to Jackson that night. So I said, you know, hop in. Um, he hopped in the back of my Jeep. We then, you know, proceeded to make small talk. Um, but before he came in the car, he offered to pay us like $200 to give him a ride, like 10 miles. So that was kind of weird. Um, he then told us he's been camping for multiple days without his fiance. He did say he had a fiance and that she was working on their social media page back at their van. Um, then once like in conversation, I brought up, yep, like we're going to Jackson. Um, he freaked out. He's like, nope, I need to get out right now. Um, you know, like pull over. So we pulled over at the Jackson Dam, which I don't know if you're, um, if you know, like Teton Park, but it's not very far from Coulter Bay. And if this does like 
reach people i can post pictures of you know exactly where we were we picked him up and the whole route or whatever and like screenshots of like the timestamps. we dropped him off at 609 p.m on august 29th um he kind of like hurried out of the car and then he's like okay i'm just gonna go find someone else to you know hitchhike and we're like okay um it was a weird situation so when we picked him up he was wearing a backpack he had a long sleeve pants hiking boots and he had like scruff um but he didn't look dirty for someone who was camping for multiple days like he didn't look dirty he didn't smell dirty so that part was kind of weird um and i'm just really hoping that they find her and this this helps someone like remember seeing him or you know something like that hi to clarify a few things that people are confused on still um when he asked to ride he has to go to jackson which if you're familiar with the area a lot of people call jackson hole jackson so that's why i said yes to giving him a ride but you think any good hiker would know south and north we were going south of the park when he said he was camping north he had told us that him and gabby were not camping on a regulated campsite through the national park that they were camping basically out in the middle of nowhere along snake river this is key information he said that he had hiked for days along snake river but when like looking at his backpack it wasn't full and he said all he had was a tarp to sleep on which you think if you're going camping for days on end you'd want food and a tent and he had none of that and like i said he looked clean and didn't smell bad too so this is a view of the whole de um, journey with brian so that's the top at the park at coulter bay and then we drove him to this dam right here then at the dam we dropped him off at this little turno and he said he was going to walk across the street to the parking lot which was full of people to continue hitchhiking um and look for a ride because he freaked out when i said jackson hole he said we needed to pull over even though Jackson and Jackson Hole are the same thing. It's the same town itself. This is the text I sent to my mom at 6.09 right when he got out of the car saying I was okay because she was freaking out. This is at the park or at the pickup location and um, we were taking a shower. We then walked across and our car was parked on the left side of the picture and he talked to us like right in the middle. And um, he was talking to my boyfriend the entire time. But, like, I was the one actually talking, and he was, like, not frantic, and he was very nice, very polite to us. Another witness claims she picked up Brian around 6.20 near the Jackson Lake Dam and dropped him off at the entrance to the Spread Creek dispersed camping area. She claims Brian was acting strange and antsy and refused to be taken any further into the park than the entrance, even though she offered to drive him the several miles in. He was acting strange before he left the vehicle, and as they drew closer to the camp entrance, this only intensified. September 1st, and Brian returns home, alone. He arrives in the Ford Transit, and Gabby is not with him. It's anyone's guess what he told his parents when they inevitably asked, Where's Gabby? You would imagine that they would be understandably concerned, if not for Brian's mental health, but for Gabby's safety, his fiance. What exactly transpired between August 29th and Brian's arrival home on September 1st is very unclear. However, Brian did use Gabby's credit cards for purchases over $1,000 between August 30th and the 1st of September, presumably on his route back to Florida. Not one of the laundries contacted Gabby's parents to let them know the sudden change of plans. As far as they knew, Brian and Gabby were still on their cross-country adventure. September 4th, and Brian strangely purchases a new phone with AT&T. September 6th, and the Laundries decide to go on a camping trip to Fort DeSoto Park in Pinellas County. A strange decision, with Gabby, Brian's fiance, absent from the picture. Joe Petito and Nicole Schmidt, Gabby's parents, having found out about Brian's return without their daughter, sparked a multitude of questions and quick concern. They reached out to the laundries immediately, a number of times, but were stonewalled. The laundries remained tight-lipped and ambivalent, and with each refusal to speak, 
Gabby's parents began to suspect the worst. We're all hoping for the best here. Um, a lot of the details you've, you've heard, I mean, it's, uh, they're, they're, they're tough to, to stay positive, really. Positivity is hard. Trying to focus on, on the scenario I have in my head, that she's stuck somewhere and she's just, you know, uh, just needs help, you know, and we, you know, we gotta just go get her and, and bring her home. I, I know how these things sometimes end, you know, and I'm just trying not to think of that. All the social media, the media attention, I mean, it's really hard to deal with, you know, but it is needed. Uh, your family's gone out to Montana. Wyoming. Wyoming, sorry. Uh, why? It's the last known place that we have. I mean, listen, we're not getting a lot of information, and rightfully so. I understand why it is an investigation, but it's the last information that we have that's that's corroborated. So um, we're, we got to start somewhere, you know. So she's good. We bring her home. You know, she tells us what, what you know what happened. You know, and we move on. So. What do you think of Brian? I don't. Right now, I, hey, listen. I got. I do. I do. And I, I also think of his parents, but anything that I say here is, is not going to help me out there, you know. So that'll be later on. I'll let the courts and, you know, uh, society judge them. I've already did my judgment. It's not going to change. So, so now I'm focusing on what matters. They would officially report Gabby missing on September 11th. Police immediately began an investigation and went to the laundry home. They did not speak with Brian directly, and the laundry elders simply referred investigators to their lawyer for statement. Brian was immediately suspect, if only circumstantially at this point. Police set up surveillance of the laundry residence regardless. They pulled all available records, including cell phone pings and bank records, and Brian would be named a person of interest. Not directly for Gabby's unexplained disappearance. Rather, the inquiry was based upon the credit card transactions. Fraud, in the least. However, investigators likely assumed the worst. On September 12th, Brian speaks to the family lawyer, Steve Bertolino. Bertolino would later confirm this, but had nothing to add about their conversation, or Brian's intentions. During the surveillance, police believed they saw Brian, and at the time were certain they knew his location. Police Chief Todd Garrison told reporters, all I'm going to say is we know where Brian Laundrie is. However, on September 17th, they would retract this statement after the Laundries report Brian is missing. They now believe they had mistaken Brian's mother as Brian himself, although the differences in stature and height cannot be understated. Florida authorities admit that mistakes were made in the investigation into Brian Laundrie. He was considered a person of interest regarding the death of his fiance, Gabby Petito. But these apparent lapses by police may have played a factor in their inability to question Laundrie before his own death. Reporter Erica Jackson has more. Like mother, like son. Do you see the resemblance? Northport police think Brian Laundrie looks very much like his mom, Roberta. They're kind of built similarly. Northport PD spokesperson Josh Taylor told me police started tracking Brian after Gabby Petito's family reported her missing in New York. That was Saturday, September 11th. Police watched him leave in his Mustang, Monday, September 13th, and come back Wednesday, September 15th. All I'm going to say is I know where Brian's at. Chief Todd Garrison made that comment on Thursday, September 16th, confident he knew Brian was inside his parents' home. That changed the next day, Friday, September 17th. When the family reported him on Friday, that was certainly news to us that they had not seen him. Uh, we thought that we'd seen Brian initially come back into that home on that Wednesday. But Chris and Roberta Laundry told investigators they hadn't seen their son since Tuesday. They later changed their statement to Monday. Was it just someone else that you saw? Uh, I believe it was, it was his mom who was wearing a baseball cap. They had returned from the park with that Mustang. So who does that, right? Like, if you think your son's missing since Tuesday, you're going to bring his car back to the home. So it didn't make sense that anyone would do that if he wasn't there. So the individual getting out with a baseball cap we thought was Brian. 
Brian had left his Northport home a few days earlier without any of the usual things people are never without, his wallet and his new cell phone, in the least. Brian had allegedly told his parents he was going for a walk at the Mayakahatchee Creek Environmental Park. Father Chris allegedly would later report that one of his guns was missing in conjunction with his son's disappearance. Chris claims he would go to the park later that night to search for his son, but did not find him or any trace of him. All of this was on the crest of the media coverage. The laundries and even the Petito Schmidt clan were the focus of a nation by this point, and alongside all the speculation on what had happened came all the harassment. Neighbors and friends alike, news reporters and would-be journalists, they all flooded the families, and in this age of social media and freedom of rights, people exercised their ability to voice their thoughts without pausing to consider respect for either family. But right now we got to hunt him as a wanted fugitive. So the reason I went to Mr. Landry is because I carry a reputation with me. September 19th, and the search for Gabby Petito comes to an end. Human remains are found in the Grand Teton National Park and are determined to be Gabby. Right from the beginning of the now severely scaled down search efforts, the laundries had told investigators exactly where to look for their son pointing out trails he may have traveled and his favorite stops in the Carlton Reserve. Authorities would attempt to search the areas, but there was a recent flood and the usually dry clearing was under a foot or more of water. On October 6th, Chris Laundry was supposed to join law enforcement on the search for his son, but his presence was postponed for undisclosed reasons. October 7th, and authorities asked Chris to join them again and it's unclear whether or not he assisted them this second time. Both Chris and Roberta were under fire during this time for their perceived lack of effort in searching for their missing son, and their lawyer, Steve Bertolino, would later issue a statement that the laundries were not permitted to search the park as it was closed to the public. A strange claim as investigators had asked them to accompany them on the search more than once. October 20th, and both laundry elders join authorities on the search. Perhaps not so coincidentally, Chris, Brian's father, finds Brian's dry bag in a bush near where they had told authorities to look. It was hidden, sort of, at least from plain view, and the previous search parties that had been through the park failed to see it. Initially, Chris leaves the bag where it is but decides to pick it up and bring it with him to police, suggesting he only did so as he did not want reporters contaminating the evidence. Remains were found close by in a thickly wooded area just off the trail in the Carlton Reserve in Sarasota County, about a 45 minute walk from the entrance of the Mayakahatchee Creek Environmental Park. The skeletal remains were scattered, and investigators are confident that only bones were found due to wildlife in the area. Coyotes, alligators, and other rodents. They were spread across a large area. The medical examiner suggested that the remains had been underwater for an extended period of time, accelerating the level of decomposition. It would be dental records that would later confirm the remains to be that of Brian Laundry and after forensic examination, it was determined that Brian had died from a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. Found nearby the skeletal remains were his Nalgene water bottle, the dry bag that contained a tent and flares, a red hat with the logo Moab Coffee Roasters on it, and a wooden box that contained a small notebook and some photos. Reports suggest that the notebook was found outside the dry bag and had been exposed to the elements. It was soaked and investigators were unsure it could be salvaged. Alongside the dry bag, an apparent suicide note was found written by Brian to his parents and it was released to the public soon after.
Mom and Dad, I just want to say that I'm sorry for everything that's happened. I never intended for any of this. Gabby and I were truly in love and I would give anything for her to still be here. I know that no one will understand that things simply got out of control. The strain of our relationship was more than I could bear. I should have known to stay home after what happened in Moab. Everything was already a disaster at that point, but something made me return. Once Gabby was gone forever, I realized I was too. When we went camping at Fort DeSoto, I wanted to tell you what really happened, but I couldn't bring myself to. Please forgive me for all that's happened and all that I put everyone through. I was too ashamed to tell Gabby's family what happened to her. I was too ashamed to tell anyone. I hope someday people can understand what really happened. Until we meet again someday, I love you forever. Late in June of 2022, authorities would release pages from the journal that was salvaged from the dry bag. Like the suicide note, much is left to answer. If the release was intended to give some closure to grieving friends and family, or even to the public, the journal's ambiguous return does not. Gabby, I wish I was right at your side. I wish I could be talking to you right now. I'd be going through every memory we've made, getting even more excited for the future. I can't live without you. I've lost every day we could have spent together, every holiday. I'll never get to play with blank again. Never go hiking with TJ. I loved you more than anything. I can't bear to look at our photos to recall great times because it's why I can't go on. When I close my eyes, I will think of laying on the roof of the van, falling asleep to the sight of a meteor shower at the Crystal Geyser. I will always love you. If you were reading Gab's journal, looking at the photos from our life together, flipping through old cards, you wouldn't want to live a day without her. Knowing that every day you'll wake up without her, you wouldn't want to wake up. I'm so sorry to everyone this will affect. Gabby was the love of my life, but I know, adored by many. I'm so very sorry to her family, because I love them. I'd consider her younger siblings my best of friends. I'm sorry to my family. This is a shock to them as well as a terrible grief. They loved as much, if not more than me. A new daughter to my mother, an aunt to my nephews. Please do not make this harder for them. This occurred as an unexpected tragedy. Rushing back to our car, trying to cross the streams of Spread Creek before it got too dark to see, too cold, I hear a splash and a scream. I could barely see. I couldn't find her for a moment. I shouted her name. I found her breathing heavily, gasping my name. She was freezing cold. We had just come from the blazing hot national parks in Utah. The temperature had dropped to freezing and she was soaking wet. I carried her as far as I could down the stream towards the car, stumbling, exhausted in shock, when my knees buckled and I knew I couldn't safely carry her. I started a fire and spooned her as close to the heat. She was so thin, had already been freezing too long. I couldn't at the time realize that I should have started a fire first, but I wanted her out of the cold back to the car. From where I started the fire, I had no idea how far the car might be. I only knew it was across the creek. When I pulled Gabby out of the water, she couldn't tell me what hurt. She had a small bump on her forehead that eventually got larger. Her feet hurt, her wrist hurt, but she was freezing, shaking violently. While carrying her, she continually made sounds of pain. Laying next to her, she said little lapsing between violent shakes, gasping in pain, begging for an end to her pain. She would fall asleep and I would shake her awake, fearing she shouldn't close her eyes if she had a concussion. She would wake in pain and start the whole painful cycle again while furious that I was the one waking her. She wouldn't let me try to cross the creek, thought like me that this fire would go out in her sleep and she'd freeze. 
I don't know the extent of Gabby's injuries, only that she was in extreme pain. I ended her life. I thought it was merciful, that it's what she wanted. But I see now all the mistakes I made. I panicked. I was in shock. But from the moment I decided, took away her pain, I knew I couldn't go on without her. I rushed home to spend any time I had left with my family. I wanted to drive north and let James or TJ kill me, but I wouldn't want them to spend time in jail over my mistake, even though I'm sure they would have liked to. I'm ending my life not because of fear of punishment, but rather because I can't stand to live another day without her. I've lost our whole future together, every moment we could have cherished. I'm sorry for everyone's loss. Please do not make life harder for my family. They lost a son and a daughter. The most wonderful girl in the world. Gabby, I'm sorry. I've killed myself beside this creek in the hopes that animals may tear me apart, that it may make some of her family happy. Please pick up all of my things. Gabby hated people who litter. Thank you once again for watching or listening. As this episode comes to an end, I feel like this tragic story will never truly be resolved. With so many loose ends and an almost never-ending trail of speculative evidence, with Brian now gone and the laundry's heroically tight-lipped, the answers everyone is looking for will likely never come to light. The elder laundries have seemed to move on, both figuratively and literally selling their house and moving to an undisclosed location as soon as they could, an attempt to escape the public eye, most likely. Their whereabouts is currently unknown. The Petito Schmidt clan understandably has ongoing pain and trauma from the events, and have not stopped in their quest for justice over the murder of their beloved daughter. They are presuming damages in a lawsuit against the laundries, only suing for a small sum. The lawsuit may be more about justice than getting rich. This story drained me, both part one and two, and I'm happy to have it behind me. While all true crime stories are tragic, the underlying issues of this sad tale have far-reaching implications, and it's certainly something we, as a whole, need to address. I have a Patreon, the key source of income for this channel. I often think of this channel as being crowdfunded through Patreon, as YouTube finds most of my content unsuitable for advertisers. Through my Patreon, for about the cost of a coffee each month, you can contribute to the channel and help keep it alive. This project of passion takes both a lot of time and a lot out of me, 
and the monetary head nod helps remind me that people out there believe in the channel. I'm constantly humbled by the support I receive and want you, my patrons, my producers, to know I'm forever grateful. Chippy Heck, Michelle Delecki, Dominic Drago, thank you. YouTube has implemented a new feature for advertiser-friendly content, the requirements of which my channel does not always meet. The thanks button, much like Patreon, is the way you can make a donation to the channel without having to subscribe to Patreon. Agat Milger, Ilza Kalnina, 1515 Hando. Thank you. Subscribing to the channel and turning on notifications truly helps with ranking my channel higher on the YouTube platform and, and does not cost a thing. Subscribing with notifications will let you know when new content is released and helps build credibility within the YouTube universe. Liking, commenting, and sharing helps in similar ways, and altogether these four metrics help to expose something criminal to a larger audience. Thank you. I have a few interesting stories in mind for the next episode, although I always appreciate suggestions from viewers. Most, if not all, suggestions have made it to my research folder, but I'm confident we'll get to them one day. Until next time, thank you once again for joining me in this episode of Something Criminal. I don't know what I meant to feel anymore. Take it out of my girls and smash that door I fucked around with myself and I let you know That if you're up there watching, start the show Say it's over my friend how long until the end Cause I'm past the point where I can amend I don't love myself but I can pretend Repeated cycles in my head bringing me down And I've been itching at the back of my head the crown If I remain or inside my head, it's one of the two Cause this head is controlling me, and me it's just you Say it's over my friend, how long until the end? Cause I'm past the point where I can amend I don't love myself, but I can pretend
Cause I'm past the point where I can mend. I don't love myself, but.